Hello, BookTube. Yesterday you gave me the great pleasure of letting me read to you, and I want to do that again <laughs> today. I want to indulge myself again today. I want to read you from Prentice Alvin by Orson Scartcard, the third book in his Tales of Alvin Maker series. This is a fantasy series set in a colonial era, post-revolution, immediately post-revolution, uh, but still agrarian era, alternate version of America. Uh, the territories are different, they have variations on the names, and the fantasy element that comes into this involves a kind of folklore, homespun magic, a system that Card invented for this book and this series, especially the short stories that started it off, Hatrack River and uh, Alvin and the No-Go Plow, uh, that involves knacks. It in Every single person in this world has a knack of some kind or other and of some strength or other. There are torches who are able to see the heart fire of other people, know the truth from the falsehood, know the motivations, and who therefore are especially useful as midwives because they can see the heart fire of the little baby as well and know what they may or may not need to do. There are dousers, people who, who use their knack to find water in an era when that was absolutely crucial. Uh, there are hexes that people can weave all around their stuff, and there are people who are better at hexes than others. Uh, everybody's better or worse at these things. There are doodlebugs, uh, which is Orson Scott Card's idea of uh, what Julian May in the Pliocene Exile refers to as far-seeking, where a person can sort of detach part of their senses to go into something else and look around in it. Uh, there are firebugs who are pyrotechnics. They can, they can set fire, heat things up or set things on fire from a distance. And a whole bunch of other things, including some knacks that are rarer than others, some knacks that are, that are far less common. For instance, Napoleon Bonaparte uh, makes an appearance in these novels, and his knack is to bend the people around him to his will, unless they're specifically protected from him with some charm or hex or other. He can bend them to his will. And in this world of knacks, of uh, torches and doodlebugs and whatnot, there's also the rumor of something much greater, of the sum of all those knacks build, build, built together into one person, a maker with a capital M. And uh, there are all sorts of stories, all sorts of rumors that maybe Ben Franklin was a maker, that maybe Jesus Christ was a maker. Uh, and... The central character in the stories, Alvin, is the seventh son of a seventh son, which apparently in this world increases the odds of something witchy and spectacular about you. In the first book in the series, Seventh Son, uh, we see the story of his family and his brethren, and we see the tragic, heroic lengths to which his brother goes to make sure he is the seventh son of a seventh son. It's a scene that I should read you someday. It's amazing. Just amazing. And then in uh, the second book, Red Prophet, little boy Alvin, who is just only starting to realize all the things that he can do and starting to get a vague glimpse of the, of the fact that he has more than one knack, that he doesn't just have one little thing that he can do, sometimes a little well, that seems to be no limit to what he can do. In that book, he is guided and instructed not only by William Blake, uh, but also by the the uh, the two Shawnee brothers who were famous in the real world, uh, Tecumseh and his brother the Prophet, uh, who teach him valuable lessons. All of those people teach Alvin valuable lessons about responsibility. Uh, in this third book, it's time for Alvin to go and be an apprentice. Just the natural way of the world. It's time for him to go and learn a trade. And he goes to a man uh, named Makepeace, who is a blacksmith for a village, a, a very complexly drawn man. It, it, Orson Scott Card is so good at drawing characters. He's good at drawing black and white characters, characters who are purely evil, for instance. He has a particular skill at that. Uh, but he's very good at drawing characters who have all sorts of personality traits inside them, all jostling together. Uh, and Alvin becomes uh, Makepeace Smith's apprentice, hence the name of the book. He's Prentice Alvin, and he grows to manhood, and he makes a decision early on when Prentice Smith takes him in that he will not use his knack to become good at smithing, He will, and he will not use his knack to build his, the muscles that he needs 
He can easily do that. He knows, he can sense inside his own body exactly what he needs to tell his muscles to do in order to be brawny tomorrow. But he doesn't, he decides instead, I will do this honestly. I will make this, I will make this a craft I actually learn. And he does over the course of the book. Time passes, year, years pass. And by the time we get to the part I want to read you, Alvin is not a boy anymore, obviously. He's, he's a blacksmith's apprentice, a big, brawny young man who has become impatient with the things that he can do. He wants to do more. And he's been listening to a woman named Miss Larner, who is herself incredibly hexed up. Hex is not only against uh, danger, Hex is of self-preservation, but Hex is also against discovery. Even a clear look at her face, her whereabouts, her thoughts, all of that, triply and quadruply hexed over. And when Alvin sees that, he wonders why a small-town school teacher would bother to do that. He doesn't at first know. The reason for that is that she is another character who is hiding specifically from him. Uh, but in the course of his blacksmithing, in the course of her being in, in the village, he they have conversations and she tells him about some of the outside world, about books, about poetry, even about science and scientific theories. Uh, and that, that feeds into the passage that I want to read you here, because this is Alvin... Uh, this passage informs the cover of the book. And I don't want you to worry about spoilers, because a lot happens in this book that has nothing to do with the no-go plow. Uh, the main plot of the book has nothing to do with that. This is just a side thing, but it's fascinating. This is a, a conversation between Miss Larner and Prentice Alvin. And I'm, I'm going to read it. The conversation is difficult to read. I don't have the skill, as I mentioned yesterday. I don't have the skill of someone like Sean or Olive. Uh, but I'm going to do my best, uh, because this is fascinating. An absolutely fascinating uh, performance on Orson Scott Card's part of explaining quantum reality, believe it or not, of explaining uh, the world, how matter works. Uh, I'm going to turn it to gold, said Alvin. Miss Larner raised an eyebrow. And what then? What will you tell people about a golden plow? That you found it somewhere? that you happen to have some gold lying about and thought, this is just enough to make a plow? You're the one who told me a maker was one who could turn iron to gold. Yes, but that doesn't mean it's wise to do. Miss Larner walked out of the hot forge into the stagnant air of late afternoon. It was cooler, but not much. The first hot night of spring. Yes, but that doesn't mean... Uh, no, sorry. <laughs> uh, more than gold, said Alvin. Or at least not normal gold. Regular gold isn't good enough for you? Gold is dead, like iron. It isn't dead. It's simply earth without fire. It, wasn't, it never was alive, so it can't be dead. You're the one who told me that if I can imagine it, then maybe I can make it come to be. And you can imagine living gold? A plow that cuts the earth with no ox to draw it. She said nothing, but her eyes sparkled. If I could make such a thing, Miss Larner, would you consider as how I'd graduated from your school of makers? I'd say you were no longer apprentice maker. Just what I thought, Miss Larner. A journeyman blacksmith and a journeyman maker both, if I can do it. And can you? Alvin nodded, then shrugged. I think so. But it's what you said about Adams back in January. I thought you gave up on that. No, ma'am. I was just thinking. What is it you can't cut into smaller pieces? And then I thought, why, if it's got any size at all, it can be cut. So an atom, it's nothing more than just a place. One exact place with no width at all. Euclid's geometric point? Well, yes, ma'am, except that you said his geometry was all imaginary, and this is real. But if it has no size, Alvin, that's just what I thought. If it's got no size, then it's nothing. But it isn't nothing, it's a place. Only then I thought, it isn't a place, it just has a place. If you see the difference. An atom can be in one place, one pure geometric point, like you said, but then it can move. It can be somewhere else. So you see, it not only has a place, it has a past and a future. Yesterday it was here, today it's here, tomorrow over yonder. But it isn't anything, Alvin. No, I know, but it isn't, it isn't anything. But it ain't nothing, neither. Isn't. Either. <laughs> I know all that grammar, Miss Larner, but I'm not thinking about it right now. You won't have good grammar unless you use it even when you're not thinking about it. 
but never mind. See, I start thinking, if this atom's got no size, how can anybody tell where it is? It's not giving off any light because it's got no fire in it to give off. So here's what I come up with. Just suppose this atom's got no size, but it's still got some kind of mind. Some kind of tiny little wit, just enough to know where it is. And the only power it has to move is to move somewhere else and know where it is then. How could that be? A memory in something that doesn't even exist. Just suppose it. Say you got thousands of them just lying around, just going any which way. How can any of them tell where they are? Since all the others are moving any which way, nothing around it stays the same. But then suppose somebody comes along, and I'm thinking about God here. Somebody who says, who can show them a pattern, show them some way to set still. Like he says, you there, you're the center, and all the rest of you, you just stay the same distance away from him all the time. Then what have you got? Miss Larner thought for a moment. A hollow sphere. A ball. But still composed of nothing, Alvin. But don't you see? That's why I knew this was true. I mean, if there's one thing I know from doodlebugging, it's that everything's mostly empty. That anvil? It looks solid, don't it? But I tell you, it's mostly empty. Just the little bits of iron stuff hanging a certain distance from each other, all patterned there. But most of the anvil is empty space between. Don't you see? Those bits are acting just like the atoms I'm talking about. So let's say the anvil's like a mountain. Only when you get real close, you see it's made of gravel. And then you pick up the gravel, it crumbles in your hand, and you see it's made of dust. And if you could pick up a single fleck of dust, you'd see that it was just like the mountain, made of even tinier gravel all over again. You're saying that what we see as solid objects are really nothing but illusion? Little nothings making tiny spheres that are put together to make your bits and pieces made from bits and the anvil made from pieces? Only there's a lot more steps in between, I reckon. Don't you see? That explains everything. Why is it that all I have to do is imagine a new shape or a new pattern or a new order and it shows in my mind? And if I think it clear and strong enough and command the bits to change, why they do? Because they're alive. They may be small and none too bright, but if I show them clear enough, they can do it. This is too strange for me, Alvin, to think that everything is really nothing. No, Miss Larner, you're missing the point. The point is that everything is alive. That everything is made out of living atoms, all obeying the commands that God gave them. And just following those commands, why some of them get turned into light and heat, and some of them become iron, and some water, and some air, and some of them our own skin and bones. All those things are real, and so those atoms are real. Alvin, I told you about atoms because they were an interesting theory. The best thinkers of our time believe there are no such things. Begging your pardon, Miss Larner, but the best thinkers never saw the things I saw, so they just don't know diddly. I'm telling you that this is the only idea I can think of that explains it all, what I see and what I do. But where do those atoms come from? They don't come from anywhere. Or rather, maybe they come from everywhere. Maybe these atoms, they're just there. Always been there. Always will be there. You can't cut them up. They can't die. You can't make them and you can't break them. They're forever. Then God didn't create the world. Of course he did. The atoms were nothing, just places that didn't even know they were that. It's God who put them all into places so that they'd know where they were, and so they'd know where they were, and everything in the whole universe is made out of them. Uh, that's a conversation that he has with Miss Larner about his desire to make a living plow. But I want to read you the bit, again, I'm, not, I'm stressing, this is not a spoiler. The main dramatic parts of this book have nothing to do with this. This is an extra thing. Uh, but it informs the cover, and I love it. Absolutely love it, because this is the moment when Alvin actually tries. Uh, the fire was deep within the gold now, but all it was doing was melting it. That wouldn't do at all. It was life the plow needed, not the death of metal in the fire. He held the plow shape in his mind and showed it plain as can be every bit of metal in the plow, cried out silently to every atom, it ain't enough to be lined up like little spears of gold. You need to hold this larger shape yourselves, no matter the fire, no matter what other force might press or tear or melt or try to maim you. He could sense that he was heard. There was movement in the gold, movement against the downward slipping of the gold as it turned to fluid. But it wasn't strong enough, and it wasn't sure enough. 
Without thinking, Alvin reached his hand into the fire and clung to the gold, showing it the plow shape, crying to it in its heart, like this, be like this. This is what you are. Oh, the pain of it burned something fierce, and he knew that it was that it was right for his hands to be there, for the maker is the part of what he makes. The atoms heard him and formed themselves in ways that Alvin had never even thought of, but the result of it was all that the glow now took the heat of the fire into itself without melting, without losing shape. It was done. The plow wasn't exactly alive, not the way he wanted, but it could stand in the forge fire without melting. The gold was more than gold now. It was gold that knew it was a plow and meant to stay that way. Alvin pulled his hands away from the plow and saw the flames still dancing on his skin, which was charred in places, peeling back away from the bone. Silent as death, he plunged his hands into the water barrel and heard the sizzle of the fire on his flesh as it went out. Then, before the pain could come in full force, he set to healing himself, sloughing away the dead skin and making new skin grow. He stood there, weakened from all his body had to do to heal his hands, looking into the fire the gold plow, just setting there, knowing its shape and holding to it, but that wasn't enough to make a plow alive. It had to know what a plow was for. It had to know why it lived so it could start to act to fulfill that purpose. It had to, it, it, that was making. Alvin knew it now. That was what the Redbird come to say three years ago. Making wasn't like carpentry or smithy work or any such, cutting and bending and melting to force things into new shapes. Making was something subtler and stronger, making things want to be another way, a new shape, so they just naturally flowed that way. It was something Alvin had done for years without knowing what he was doing. When he thought he was doing no more than finding the natural cracks in stone, he was really making those cracks by imagining where he wanted them to be and showing it to the atoms within the bits, within the pieces of the rock. He taught them how to want to fulfill the shape he showed them. Now, with this plow, he had done it, not by accident, but on purpose. And he taught the gold to be something stronger, to hold better to its shape than anything he'd ever made before. But how could he teach it more? Teach it to act, to move in ways that gold was never taught to move. In the back of his mind, he knew that this golden plow wasn't the real problem. The real problem was the crystal city. The building blocks of that weren't going to be simple atoms in a metal plow. The atoms of a city are men and women, and they don't believe the shape they're shown with the simple faith that atoms have. They don't understand with such pure clarity, and when they act, their actions are never half so pure. But if I can teach this gold to be a plow and to be alive, then maybe I can make a crystal city out of men and women. Maybe I can find people as pure as the atoms of this gold who come to understand the shape of the crystal city and love it the way I did the moment I saw it, when I climbed inside the twister with Tenskwatawa, this is a vision that the prophet showed him. Then they'll not only hold that shape and make it act, but make the crystal city a living thing much larger and greater than any one of us who are its atoms. The maker is one who is part of what he makes. Alvin ran to the bellows and pumped up the fire till the charcoal was glowing hot enough to drive any regular smith outside into the night air to wait till the fire slacked. But not Alvin. Instead, he walked right up to the forge and climbed right into the heat and the flame. He felt the clothes burning right off his body, but he paid no mind. He curled himself around that plow and then commenced to healing himself, not piecemeal, not bit by bit, but healing himself by telling his whole body all at once, stay alive, put the fire that burns you into this plow. And at that same time, he told the plow, do as my body does, live Learn from every little bidding me, every living bit of me how each part of it has its purpose and acts on it. I can't show you the shape you've got to be and how it's done, because I don't know. But I can show you what it's like to be alive by the pain of my body, by the healing of it, by the struggling to stay alive. Be like this. Whatever it takes, however hard it is for you to learn, this is you. Be like me. It took forever, trembling in the fire as his body struggled with the heat, finding ways to channel it. In a way, a river channels water, pouring it out like the, into the plow like it was an ocean of golden fire. And within the plow, the atoms struggled to do what Alvin asked, wanting to obey him, not knowing how. But his call to them was strong, too strong not to hear. And it was more than a matter of hearing him, too. It was like they could tell what he wanted from, for them was good. They trusted him. They wanted to be the living plow he dreamed of, and so in a million flecks of time so small that a second seemed like eternity to them, they tried this, they tried that, until somewhere within the plow a new pattern was made that it knew itself 
to be alive, exactly as Alvin wanted it to be. And in a single moment, the pattern passed throughout the plow, and it was alive. I, there's a lot of more dramatic stuff that goes on in this book involving a runaway slave and uh, pure evil that has stalked Alvin his whole life. But for me, the explanation of the atomic world earlier, and then that scene where Alvin brings the no-go plow to life, for me, those were incredible. Just amazing. And I, you, I might note here, <laughs> I might note uh, that not only... Some of you, of course, are ritualists. Not, not probably not anybody listening to me, but in the in the broader world of of even BookTube, that is uh, largely populated by Soviet style book censors. They don't really care about reading. They care about stopping you from reading things they don't like. Uh, there are plenty of channels dedicated to that. There are whole BookTube book club groups that are dedicated to right think and wrong think. And probably those people would hear just the proposal of this Steve reads to you and say, oh, I didn't need to hear anything because Orson Scott Card doesn't like gay marriage. So we must burn everything that he wrote. I must never hear it. My, it must never cross my ears. It can't be any good. I must never like it. Obviously, I think that gays should be able to marry, and I can put that aside to enjoy his book. I might also point out that on a deeper level, the thing that we just heard, both those passages, is Orson Clark Card putting into his fantasy his own explicitly Christian creationist viewpoint? I, I needless to say, don't agree with that either. I just don't deprive myself of great reading experiences in order to censor what other people do, or to virtue signal. Uh, so, I, so I can read these things and reread them. And I, Like I've said before on this channel, I think Prentice Alvin may be, my, may be my favorite of all of the Alvin Maker books. There are great scenes in... Red Prophet and Seventh Son. There are even great scenes in a couple of the later books, but this book has the greatest through line. Uh, not, it's not pronounced, uh, mainly because Orson Scott Card was one of the very first authors to make the capital mistake of taking creative input from his readers in real time. Not letters after the fact, after the, the tales of Alan Maker are over, saying, what do you think? But readers saying, this is what you should do next. And listening to that, there were, there were all sorts of online forums where he did that, and that brought this series, effectively sapped the life out of it and brought it to a halt. Uh, but one way or another, uh, I wanted to read to you that because I love, I just love those passages. There are other parts in this book. The, the main dramatic plot lines in here are utterly gripping. But for me, somehow, maybe it's because I was introduced to the whole world of Hatrack River and Prentice Alvin and Nax and whatnot in the short story that presaged all of these books. Maybe that's why the, the short story, the short story that I'm thinking of involved the making of this plow. So watching it fit into a novel, uh, was really enjoyable. <laughs> so I wanted to, I wanted to read you that. It, uh, it picked up my spirits enormously yesterday to spend time reading to you. So I thought I would do it again today, <laughs> but uh, I'm going to wrap this up before that sunlight consumes me, <laughs> but I will be back. Thank you, BookTube.